We are live. Good evening, all. Welcome to iFocus Online, the 364th episode, 39th in the Ocular Plasty module. Today, we have with us Dr. Santosh Honava from Centre for Sight Hyderabad to speak to us the much debated thyroid disease, the medical management. Over to you, sir. Thank you, Subha. By now, you know everything about clinical evaluation of thyroid disease, isn't it? How did the class last week go? It was good. All right. So, you know everything about clinical evaluation, so I don't have to repeat anything, right? Okay. Let me start with this. Thyroid is like a house on fire, right? Because it's an inflammatory disease. We know that it's an autoimmune disease with a lot of inflammation overlay and fibrosis that results in end-stage disease. So inflammation is the one which actually fuels and finally burns out, and that results in end-stage disease, which will be either ocular motility restriction, diplopia, etc. At the stage of inflammation, the patient will have many symptoms and many signs, and the signs that the patient has and some of the symptoms that the patient has will actually, will actually translate to what is called clinical activity score. Now, this is Rundle's curve, the famous Rundle's curve. So, can you tell me the background of Rundle's curve? Can you explain in brief what is the background of Rundle's curve? How does this curve come about? Just explain briefly, not to go through Google quickly. What does it mean, Rundle's curve? What does it mean to you? What do you think it is? The um, uh, uh, it has uh, two phases as depicted: the dynamic and the static phase. Dynamic phase is uh, the what uh, is plotted. It is the severity of the thyroid orbitopathy over a period of time. Severity of thyroid orbitopathy over a period of time. Correct. So, what was the measure that was taken by Randall, the famous Randall's curve? When, in which year was it uh, plotted? Is it recent? No, sir. How, how old is it, you think? Hmm? Two articles that refer to Randall's curve or something of to that effect were in 1945 and 1960, that old. So, it's not something new. So, how many thousand patients were involved in this study? Must be a large series of patients, you no, know, to or a population-based study to affect this curve, which has become a kind of a legend. Where was Randall from? Randall was an Australian. Mm -hmm. So what did we what did he plot to depict this curve? What was severity at that time? Proptosis. That's all was plotted and eyelid retraction. So how many patients did he plot and what does this curve come about? Two patients, just two patients, all right? So two patients, but then how do you believe that a majority of patients with thyroid disease follow the Randall's curve or conform to Randall's curve? If you plot any autoimmune disease, be it SLE, rheumatoid arthritis, any autoimmune disease, they will fit into Randall's curve. Correct? The sale of your movie animal tickets, sales will fit into the Randall's curve. Okay? As somebody wrote in an editorial, they, in fact, he wrote that uh, the waistline of Americans between Thanksgiving and Valentine Day fits into the Randall's curve or Indians between Diwali and maybe Valentine's Day fits into the Randall's curve. So anything that can go into a dynamic phase and finally become static after declining or go into a plateau phase would fit into Randall's curve and so does thyroid disease. So basically any autoimmune disease would, would fit into Randall's curve. So it's become a legend because even though it was plotted initially for two patients, majority of our patients, if you plot them on the Randall's curve, they'll conform to somewhat of the Randall's curve. But the idea of treatment 
is to shorten the duration of the Randall's curve and also blunt its peak. So just by shortening the duration like this, as is shown here, you're not going to do much help to the patient. Of course, you have shortened the duration of its peak effect, of course, or severity or activity. But at the same time, you should also blunt it. Right? You make it less severe and also shorten the duration. That is what medical treatment is aimed at. If you were to do surgery at this stage, then the patient will have a lot of complications in terms of recurrence of inflammation, recurrence of activity, durability of the surgery will be unpredictable, etc. So it is in the interest of the patient that we shorten the Randall's curve and also blunt the peak of the Randall's curve, both in terms of activity, and that would actually have a telling effect on the severity of the disease. So medical management aims at treating the activity of the disease and some aspects of severity, correct? Although our aim is to treat the activity, it will have a bearing on some aspects of severity, which we understand, right? So to know what all does it affect, we should know what is activity. I think this was told to you in the class last week. These are the clinical activities for attributes, pain, pain, spontaneous retrobulbar of four weeks duration, pain on eye movement, so static pain and dynamic pain of more than four weeks duration, redness of the eyelid, redness of the conjunctiva of more than one quadrant, swelling of the eyelids, swelling of the conjunctiva, that's chemosis, and swelling of the carankle, that is seven. Seven at the first visit, and worsening of proptosis of more than two millimeter, three months, worsening of extraocular motility restriction, currently it is made eight degree of more than three months, and worsening of the visual acuity of more than one line over three months. This is on the follow-up visits because you are measuring worsening. That means that you have a baseline from which the patient is deteriorating and that will be more than four out of 10. So with this simple score, which is yes or no score, there is no subscoring here. There is no quantification of severity within each of these parameters. It's just parameters are simple yes and no, so it's very easy. And there are clinical picture photographs with which you can refer to say to say what is eyelid edema, what is conjunctival congestion, what is conjunctival chemosis, etc., which possibly was spoken to at the last class. So with this, you know the severity. And looking at this, you already understand that severity would mainly manifestation of inflammation. All these are signs of inflammation. Pain is a sign of inflammation. Redness is a sign of inflammation. Swelling is a sign of inflammation. Whereas over follow up, what also comes into the picture is the functional disability the patient faces in terms of ocular motility restriction, visual acuity worsening, and also proptosis. Now severity, there are categories of severity. This is also has defined by Yugogo, where you say mild severity, where the bottom line is that there should be minimum impact on the patient's life. So any retraction which is less than two millimeter, mild soft tissue involvement, there is no definition, but it is partly subjective, partly objective. Exophthalmus of less than three millimeter above the normal range for age and gender, race and gender. And also if it is unilateral, obviously the difference between the two eyes transient or no diplopia. Some patients complain of diplopia when they wake up. Over a period of time, it normalizes. That's transient diplopia. Or if a patient is moving the eye very rapidly, at some point they may experience diplopia, but that becomes normalized very soon. And mild corneal exposure that is responsive to use of lubricants. This is mild severity. There is nothing called moderate severity. It is moderate to severe severity, which in summation would be sufficient impact on daily life. But there is no imminent threat to sight. Patient has exothalmus of more than 3 millimeter. Inconstant or constant diplopia in functional positions of gaze. When you talk about functional positions of gaze, you should know the occupation of the patient. For most of us, it is primary position and down gaze. But if the patient is a builder or an architect, they tend to stand at the ground level and look up the building. Obviously, that will be their functional position of gaze because they are looking up, right? 
so functional position of the gaze varies from patient to patient depending on the occupation and you should ascertain whether they are able to have or are, don't have diplopia in positions which are useful for their occupation moderate to severe soft tissue involvement or eyelid retraction more than 2 mm this comes to moderate to severe severity so we know what is activity we know what is severity and very severe slash threat sight threatening is imminent threat to vision either because of dysthyroid optic neuropathy which it could be either compressive optic neuropathy or stretch neuropathy or corneal breakdown due to severe exposure so this is very severe or sight threatening now management depends on the activity and also severity if a patient has whatever form of disease mild moderate or severe disease but it has been inactive for more than 6 months some consider even 3 months but 6 months is ideal then if it's mild then you can do interval symptomatic conservative management lifestyle modification you ask them to see smoking smoking affects the course of thyroid disease in many ways it reduces the efficacy of immunomodulators the baseline disease severity and activity would be higher in smokers it also prolongs the duration of activity despite optimal medical management it increases the relapse of activity it also makes the surgery less or the effects of surgery less durable so cessation of smoking is one of the lifestyle modification that you advise achieve stable euthyroid status there should be no fluctuation and the patient ideally should not fluctuate between hypothyroid and hypothyroid the longer the hypothyroid status from hypothyroid status longer hypothyroid trough predicts recurrence of activity and you can also give selenium 200 microgram as uh, sodium selenite or 100 microgram is the active selenium in 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 thereof twice a day for 6 months is supposed to help in these patients and then perform sequential surgery when the patient crosses the threshold of 6 months if the disease is stable yeah. and inactive so you go by decompression squint and eyelid so it's very straight forward if a patient has severe form of disease but has been inactive during the phase of the observation you put the patient through this conservative measures and once the phase of observation is over then you go on to do sequential surgery now if a patient has been inactive for more than 6 months this is what i said decompression squint and eyelid so what is the role of primary medical management then if a patient has mild disease that is mild severity and the disease is inactive then you do the same thing as you did for the previous set of patients control thyroid status add selenium control hypercholesterolemia this is an emerging risk factor if a patient has high ldl then that is supposed to affect the uh, control of patients in terms of activity and also increase the chance of patient having peaks of activity after having a reasonable amount of course of remission use lubricants quit smoking and you can use botox fillers or surgery for eyelid retraction if stable for more than 6 months this is for mild disease which is inactive so this is the ugogo uh, recommendation local treatment as we already said artificial tears especially when a patient has dry eye now why does a patient of thyroid disease have dry eye any idea what are the reasons why a patient with thyroid disease would have dry eye uh increase in the ocular surface area okay exposure because of widened ocular surface area all right because uh, of retraction upper lid and lower lid then inflammation and thyroid disease can also involve the palpebral lobe of the lacrimal gland okay and also the orbital lobe yes causing sclerosis and reduced reflex tear formation prolonged inflammation of the conjunctiva can affect the accessory lacrimal glands and reduce basic secretion tear osmolality changes right and the patients tend to have incomplete blinking 
correct? And patients also tend to have infrequent blinking. They have a staring appearance and more importantly, nocturnal lack of thalamus. So there are many reasons why a patient with thyroid disease will have dry eye and manifestations of dry eye. So YouGoGo advises, as we always do, artificial tears, especially when the dry eye is documented, and gels to protect the cornea at bedtime. And selenium supplementation for six months. This is evidence-based recommendation by YouGoGo in patients who have mild disease. Now, a patient has active disease, but severity could be anything. Mild severity, but with impaired lifestyle, moderate to severe disease, and sight threatening severity. So, activity is one, then severity of any degree, mild, but with impaired lifestyle, then you consider medical management. So, clear indications are patients who have symptomatic exophthalmus, disabling diplopia, moderate to severe soft tissue signs, corneal exposures, compressive optic neuropathy, where you have to treat these patients. Now, many of these patients are treated with oral steroids. Do you think oral steroids help in these patients? How do you decide which patient goes on oral steroids and does oral steroid help at all? Or if it helps, to what extent? All the general measures are the same. So I'm not going to repeat the general measures. But how do oral steroids help? Oral steroids given in a dose of 1 milligram per kg body weight tapered over 4 to 6 months would cause a lot of side effects for sure. But they also help in about a third of patients. In fact, oral steroids given in any active disease would cause remission in 30% of patients and 70% of patients would either not benefit at all or would have recurrence of activity, right? So they're helpful, but not in a significant majority of patients. They're helpful in only a minority of patients. When you consider intravenous steroids, I mean intravenous methylprednisolone given as whatever form of pulse therapy, 70% or two-thirds of patients go into remission. One-third of patients either don't get benefited at all or they go back into activity over a period of time. They have recurrence of activity. right? That is decent enough. Compared to 30, 70, 70, 30 sounds very nice. But when you add immunomodulators to it, although the percentage is slightly higher, only 10% which you may think that well, it is not very impressive, but looking at the number of patients who have thyroid disease, that becomes a big number. You can avoid surgery in so many patients. 80% of patients go into remission and remain in remission for a prolonged period of time, which is considered as anything more than three years. And only 20% of patients will not have significant activity or they will recover. No significant uh, effect of treatment is measured as reduction in proptosis of more than 2 millimeter, reduction in lid retraction of more than 2 millimeter, reduction of clinical activity score of even 1 is considered relevant, right? And improvement in ocular fertility by more than 8 degrees or improvement in binocular field of fixation. Degree is not mentioned there. So any of this is considered a response, correct? So with those parameters in place, if you look at all the published studies, this is the rough data that you get, 30, 70, 70, 30, and 80, 20. So if at all you want to kind of go in favor of things that maximum benefits the patient, that is a combination of intravenous steroids with immunomodulation that benefits the patient the most. But if a patient has a contraindication for immunomodulator, that doesn't mean that you should not use intravenous methylprednisolone. So wherever there is no contraindication for intra immunomodulation, you should use both intravenous steroids and immunomodulation wherever it is indicated. Otherwise, intravenous steroids should at least be used. And beyond that, there are immunobiologicals, radiotherapy, and intraorbital steroids. Immunobiologicals, I'll come to a little later. But what about radiation? What do you know about radiation in thyroid disease? 
does it help it's very popular in certain centers right and what is the dose that is given 2000 centigrade 2000 centigrade is the dose that is given over 10 fractions some even give 15 to 20 fractions how does it help what is what does the effect of radiotherapy compare with in large series randomized trials clinical trials prospective studies what does it compare with maxima it compares with the effect of oral steroids right so do you want to risk a patient for radiation if it at best compares with the effect of oral steroids 30 70 there are a lot of side effects of radiation as well it will worsen the dry eye that the patient already has ocular motility improvement is not documented with radiation in fact patients may go into fixed diplopia and tight muscles which are very difficult to operate and many of these patients are also in the age group or in the uh, demographic profile to have diabetes and if they have background diabetic retinopathy or any form of early diabetic retinopathy it will worsen they will have accelerated diabetic retinopathy if you expose them to radiation so although radiation is very popular in some of the centers we defer from giving radiation unless we exhaust all the other safer available options now intraorbital steroids are also used intraorbital steroids are supposed to improve ocular motility supposed to reduce diplopia and generally those are given in patients who don't tolerate oral steroids or you have already exhausted the course of intravenous steroids and the patient does have certain symptoms with, for which you want to treat the dose that is given is 40 mg of trazodone given in the infratemporal quadrant or around the muscle that is inflamed for example if you find the medial rectus grossly thickened and its motility restricted you can inject the steroids along the medial rectus muscle itself But the side effect of intraorbital steroids is that the patient, if he is a steroid responder, may have a peak of intraocular pressure, which is very difficult to control because you have delivered steroid in the orbit and there is no depot that you can remove. So whenever there is an indication for intraorbital steroids, it's uh, logical to challenge these patients with topical steroids for about three weeks. And if a patient does not have elevated intraocular pressure, then you can give intraorbital steroids so intraorbital steroids are otherwise safe there is no much risk but since the risk of steroid responders having high intraocular pressure that is something that is to be considered when you plan a patient for intraorbital steroids now the recent uh, advance in the sense that you inject steroids within the levator palpebra superioris in the upper eyelid also helps certain of some of these patients from reduction in disease activity and also it helps in relieving late retraction we'll come to that little later so these are the measures that you can take in patients who have moderate to severe severity and active disease so we have been stressing on intravenous steroids and immunomodulation let's look at that more critically this is the ugogo recommended protocol where it is given every week for 6 weeks right so either 500 mg or 250 mg every week for 6 weeks initially you give pulse 1 to 6 500 to 750 mg for 6 weeks then from pulse 7 to 12 you reduce it to 250 or 500 mg if you're given 750 you come back to 500 if you're given 500 you reduce it to 250 so total cumulative dose may be about 4.5 to 7 plus grams now the problem with this is that you are exhausting your oral steroid I mean intravenous steroids very rapidly and intravenous steroids also help by creating by inducing apoptosis in activated t lymphocytes and we know that repopulation of activated t lymphocytes takes about 3 weeks just the principle of giving chemotherapy right so same thing works for activated t lymphocytes also if you time your intravenous methylprednisolone every 3 weekly then you you can 
use a lower dose of intravenous methylprednisolone. At the same time, you can prolong your course of treatment to about four and a half months. So patient will have remission, gradual, slow remission, and possibly it is more durable instead of accelerating the pulse of intravenous methylprednisolone in a patient who is only moderate to severe severity and active disease. If a patient has side-threatening thyroid disease, then weekly pulse is okay. But if a patient does not have side-threatening thyroid disease, then a lazy three-weekly protocol or low-dose intravenous methylprednisolone protocol is what is practiced. Here, the initial loading is by one and a half grams, 500 milligram every day for three days. That's 1.5 grams clearly. Then after that, every three weekly, pulse two to six, 500 milligram, only single dose. So two and a half grams over four and a half months, plus one and a half gram that you have given earlier. So total is four gram, which is a safe dose. Now, when the patient comes for say pulse three or pulse four, you critically evaluate the patient. And if you find that the effect is extremely good or good, then you have achieved your results. Results we already talked about, reduction in clinical activity score, impressive result in clinical, act clinical activity score. Patient has become inactive or has score has dropped by two at least. Lead retraction has come down by two millimeter. Proptosis has come down by 2 millimeter. Ocular motility has improved by more than 8 degree, etc. Those are secondary attributes, but the main reason why you are giving intravenous methylprednisolone to reduce activity, so activity should reduce, then you can continue with intravenous methylprednisolone alone. You don't have to add immunomodulators. But if a patient has modest, active, modest uh, if, uh, effect with three or four pulses of intravenous methylprednisolone, it's a good idea to add any of the immunomodulators. Currently, cyclosporins is also used or mycophenolate mofetil or azathioprine. So what is preferred is mycophenolate mofetil, although some favor cyclosporin. Azathioprine is a universal favorite because it is inexpensive and has known side effects which are easy to monitor. Methotrexate is very erratic, gastric absorption, so it is not preferred. So it is either mycophenolate mofetil cyclosporin or azathioprine that you add at fourth or third or fourth pulse. Why do you have to add it so early? Why can't you wait for six pulses? Is there any... Hmm? We want a gentle handshake between the uh, uh, IVMP and immunomodulators because by the time the effect of this immunomodulator sets in, it takes the time till we complete the sixth pulse. Right. So immunomodulators work, work very slowly but steadily. The moment you start them, they don't start working. It takes about four to six weeks, depending on the patient, patient's profile and the dose that you're given in the drug for the effect to kick in. Some patients even take six weeks or eight weeks. So you don't want to stop steroids and then start immunomodulators because the patient will have a possibility of peaking in terms of inflammation in the time between the last pulse of intravenous methylprednisolone and the beginning of the effect of immunomodulators. So whenever you want to start immunomodulation, it's either in pulse 3 or pulse 4, preferably pulse 4, so that there is a very smooth transition between intravenous methylprednisolone and the peak of the effect of immunomodulators. And once you start immunomodulators, some, in fact, Yugogo recommends that mycophenolate mofetil should be given for only six weeks. But most of the uh, rheumatologists or immuno immunologists believe that six weeks is too short a uh, duration to affix the, assess the efficacy of mycophenolate mofetil. It has to be given for at least six months because you're looking at something that is long term, something that will work for the patient in terms of reduction in uh, reactivation of the disease. So you give it for six months. Even azathioprine is given for six months. We don't stop the drug at six weeks and then wait for the patient to reactivate it. These are steroid sparing agents. Basically, you can reduce the uh, duration of administration of steroids and also uh, the need for continuation of intravenous methylprednisolone or reinitiation of intravenous methylprednisolone by using these agents. As the brain is a classic steroid sparing agent. How does mycophenolate mofetil work? It's a very popular drug. How does it work?
what is the mechanism of action which which cell does it work lymphocytes say something t lymphocytes or b lymphocytes it works on activated t lymphocytes it induces apoptosis of activated t lymphocytes it also works on b lymphocytes right reduction reduces antibody release it also has anti fibroblastic activity it reduces fibrosis of the orbital fat or the severity or the extent of fibrosis of the orbital fat and the extraocular muscles so azathioprine also works by a fairly similar mechanism right so that is how these drugs help by not ju just reducing the activity of the disease but also because of their secondary effect on fibroblasts and remodulation of scars they also help reduc reduce the severity of the disease that's the reason why patients have improved extraocular motility patients have remission from diplopia all this happens because of the effect of mycophenolate mofetil and azathioprine now let's look at how these drugs help in you know these three parameters exothermus extraocular motility restriction and disease activity of course we give it for disease activity now this is a patient it's obvious that he has responded in many ways his activity was not so much but he had severe disease one option was that we could have treated this patient with orbital decompression bilateral that's one option clearly because he had minimal activity right but he had stretch neuropathy so that would also have helped but here since the duration of him not being inactive was less than 2 months we favored intravenous methylprednisolone in this patient he had pain constant pain and pain on ocular motility and also his proptosis had started to increase over a period of time documented and you can see once we started intra intravenous methylprednisolone you can see the effect is quite obvious what all has happened here is that his lid retraction has definitely reduced both the upper lid as well as the lower lid and his exophthalmus has also improved not all patients respond as beautifully as this this is one more patient where you can see he had a surgery earlier he had a decompression surgery earlier you can see the lid crease incision here right lid crease incision so he had a decompression surgery earlier yet he recurred because his decompression surgery was done for this atypical unilateral thyroid obitopathy without any prior immunomodulation so he recurred and when we treated him with intravenous methylprednisolone and azathioprine he settled down he did not recur for a long duration after that so this helps even in such patients who have undergone orbital decompression earlier this is one more example of a patient where you can see evident reduction in exophthalmos correct so also of activity but i'll come to activity a little later so we are talking about reduction in exophthalmos by using medical management which does not happen in all the patients mean improvement in exophthalmos is about 3 mm so any patient who is active and has exophthalmos has a chance of remission of activity and also reduction in exophthalmos to a certain extent by using medical management about 60% of patients definitely have improvement of more than 3 mm if you use the current cut off of 2 mm then lot of patients fit into the range of efficacy now when we used 3 mm in our study we found that 59% of patients had reduction in exophthalmos of more than 3 mm with intravenous methylprednisolone right so two thirds of patients is a decent number now what happens to ocular motility you can see in this patient that his left eye is not moving up right he had diplopia in primary position retraction in the left eye following treatment you can see his movement has become better 
his lead retraction has reversed and he does not have diplop so this is a effect of no surgery at all just the medical management on this patient one more patient manifest hyper she had diplopia in all positions of gaze with intravenous methylprednisolone and oral azathioprine for 6 months you can see her eye has come back to its normal position she does not have diplopia in primary position but she continues to have some amount of diplopia in up gaze which is of no consequence to her primary and down gaze she is fine one more patient where there is diplopia in all positions of gaze left eye is not moving up following immunomodulation and intravenous methylprednisolone she has become better and the reason is very evident you can see her inferior rectus which was so thick pre treatment has normalized post treatment so you can say that well we should treat only those patients who have active disease with immunomodulation and steroids but here is a case where the patient seemingly does not have disease activity which is alarming as such but severity is quite a bit because she has thickened inferior rectus she can't move the muscle up she can't move the eye up she has diplopia would you want to do surgery in this patient would it help do surgery in such a thick muscle it may help a bit but it's not going to have impressive durable results because her muscle is thick now it's going to burn itself up in terms of inflammation over a period of time you have operated on a thick inflamed muscle surgery is an insult to the muscle you would have induced little bit of surgically induced inflammation as well finally the muscle will, will become scarred tight and the patient may have worse motility restriction and worse diplopia which may become intractable so by making this patient go through immunomodulation you have achieved two things one is that her muscle thickness has become normal she is already relieved of her diplopia so you don't need any surgery second is that even if you need surgery the durability of the surgery will be better because the muscle is more flexible now right although the scope of using prisms also comes in if the patient is not completely rid of diplopia the patient may have non surgical management as well so this is one example which is very clear one more example where you can see that the right eye is not moving down at all following mycophenolate mofetil and intravenous methylprednisolone ocular motility has got normalized and the patient does not have diplopia again 40 60 rule about 60% of patients will have resolution of diplopia in primary and down gaze or functional positions of gaze this was in a series of about 75 patients so 60% of patients benefit in terms of reduction in exophthalmos of more than 3 mm 60% of patients also benefit in terms of reduction in diplopia these patients may not be the same right some patients predominantly were treated because of diplopia and ocular motility restriction those may be the different set of patients than the patients who benefited in terms of reduction in exophthalmos and eyelid retraction the remission in disease activity is very impressive you can see here that is what we may, you know we aim this treatment mainly for remission in disease activity these are some of the examples of patients who have had impressive remission in disease activity some patients actually need rituximab this patient needed rituximab after mycophenolate mofetil for remission of activity and that is seen in about 90% of patients so what we aim at with medical management is remission from activity and that is seen in an impressive majority of patients whereas severity also reduces in about 60% of patients so this is the clinical activity score to begin with average of 7.1 and final clinical activity score is 1.2 if you look at the previously published studies which have used oral prednisolone and iv intravenous methylprednisolone you can see that uh, there is a huge difference all the numbers may not be comparable the earlier series had 15 and 18 patients respectively you can see that impression improvement in exophthalmos is impressive improvement in diplopia is impressive and improvement in activity score is also impressive when you combine intravenous methylprednisolone with immunomodulation so what does yugogo have to say about this they also use intravenous methylprednisolone but they use 500 mg every week for 6 weeks followed by mycophenolate 0.72 g a day for 6 weeks only 6 weeks 
if a patient has response or partial response then 250 mg of intravenous methylprednisolone per week is continued for 6 more weeks and mycophenolate is continued for 18 more weeks and if there is response the therapy is stopped and the patient goes into inactive stage where sequential surgery is performed if a patient has no response or deterioration with this treatment then they don't prolong this treatment any more but they go on to second line treatment i'll tell you what a second line treatment or the other option is 750 mg of intravenous methylprednisolone for 6 weeks response or no response if there is partial response then you continue with 500 mg of intravenous methylprednisolone for 6 more weeks good response start treatment and go to inactive the difference is that mycophenolate mofetil is here and that has reduced the dose of intravenous methylprednisolone here there is no mycophenolate mofetil so the dose of steroids is slightly higher 750 and 500 as opposed to 500 and 250 here and if there is no response or deterioration then you go on to second line management now what is the second line management second line management according to yugogo are these intravenous methylprednisolone second course oral prednisolone with cyclosporine or azathioprine orbital radiation with oral or intravenous steroids teptotumumab rituximab and tocilizumab these are second line management so second line management is almost on predictable lines except for the fact that we don't practice radiotherapy so much but of course immunobiologicals definitely come into picture in patients who are not responded or have deteriorated despite initial management or have relapsed for patients who have very severe form of disease or site threatening form of disease dysthyroid optic neuropathy corneal breakdown due to severe exposure then you have a different course of management here your intravenous methylprednisolone will be at a higher dose you deliver 500 to 1000 mg per day for 3 days and after that every weekly you deliver 500 to 1000 mg and if there is no improvement in 1 to 2 weeks or if the patient has worsening despite treatment or if the patient develops recent onset choroidal folds or luxation of the eye prompt decompression is to be performed which is ideally transnasal posterior medial orbital decompression for dysthyroid optic neuropathy so there is a scope for medical management even in patients who have dysthyroid optic neuropathy compressive optic neuropathy not stretch neuropathy stretch neuropathy is ideally treated with orbital decompression in an inactive phase there is a scope for medical management do patients respond this is one patient who was on the verge of losing vision bilateral severe disease that's how thick the muscles were and this is loose arsorophy is what we had to perform after repositing the chemotic conjunctiva not or tight arsorophy which would press on the eye further and all he was given was intravenous methylprednisolone and he settled on never needed any form of surgery he settled down and he is in remission to date this is one patient with severe choroidal folds with extremely compromised vision and you can see the thickness of the extraocular muscle again with high dose intravenous methylprednisolone muscle thickness reduced and choroidal folds also substantially reduced this is the yugogo recommendation intravenous methylprednisolone same as i already mentioned 500 to 1 gram as single dose repeated on three consecutive or alternate days daily monitoring of ophthalmic parameters they say after one week evaluate if the therapy is to be continued if there is no response then you go for orbital decompression if there is response then further intravenous methylprednisolone then of course immunomodulation etc so it's on predictable lines now for uh, management there are some recent advances new fire fighting techniques and these happen to be immunomodulators now there are three players in thyroid disease right so one is uh, of course fibroblast and b cell and t cell now can you explain this everything is obvious here but can you want to explain looking at this if you have read done some background reading then possibly you can explain who wants to try 
Can you explain this? Hmm? This is a graphic from the editorial that I wrote, which obviously I haven't read. Can you explain? It's self-explanatory, but try to explain. I said there are three players, fibrocyte, T-cell, and B-cell, correct? So immunobiologicals don't do much to T-cell directly. All the activated T lymphocytes are taken care of by, by intravenous methylprednisolone, which induces apoptosis of activated T lymphocytes. Their turnover time is roughly three weeks. So every three weekly when you give, they, those are taken care of. Mycophenolate mofetil, I already mentioned, they induce apoptosis of activated T cells Azathioprine also does the same. So immunobiologicals don't work much or not targeted to T cells. Immunobiologicals are targeted to the effect of T cell on fibrocyte to induce it into a fibroblast. No, there is activation of cytokines which T cells mediate. And at that level, there are certain markers. IL-6, tumor necrotizing factor alpha or TNF alpha and TGF beta, right? So these are targeted. Tocilizumab targets IL-6. TNF alpha is targeted by infliximab. It also targets TGF beta. Adalumab and etanercept also target TGF beta. So the, all these drugs are available and they're used. Tocilumab is used. Infliximab has been used, but not very popular currently. But for B cells, we have CD20, anti-CD20, that is clearly rituximab. We know that CD20, anti-CD20 is rituximab and it works very well. For IGF, insulin-like growth factor 1 antibody, we have teprotumumab. This is the latest. So, teprotumumab is something that is used currently in the West. It's FDA approved for thyroiditis. We have rituximab. We have tocilizumab. We also have these drugs which are rarely used. Now, these are the immunobiologicals that we have. Out of which, what is easy and what is readily available is rituximab. It is given as intravenous infusion. There are many protocols, but the protocol that is followed is 500 milligram once in two weeks. That is one set, followed by a gap of six weeks, reassess, and go for the second set, which is also once in two weeks. So patient gets two gram of rituximab, right? Over um, six, four, four. Ten weeks, weeks. Right. And then you leave the patient alone. If a patient rebounds, then you can give it again or more of rituximab can be given. It should not be infused on a continuous basis. Majority of patients, if they have to settle down, will settle down with about 2 grams of rituximab and they don't need any further rituximab. So how, does, how do all these drugs help? Can you explain again? It's there in the graphic. How do all these drugs help? Finally, all these Mediators, they work on the orbital fibroblast. Orbital fibroblast can transform itself into myofibroblast and also differentiate into adipocyte. So by using and also deposition of glycosaminoglycans, hyaluronic acid. So by interfering or aborting the process, you are benefiting the patient from getting into much severe form of disease or functional disability, right? So immunobiological actually have a role to play in the man medical management of thyroid disease. So summing it up, anti-CD20 drug is rituximab, anti-tumor necrosis factor, inhibitor factor, etanercept and infliximab, anti-IL-6 receptor is tocilizumab, and inhibitor of insulin-like growth factor 1 receptor is 
teplotomimab. These are the drugs that are currently available. Rituximab was studied, not a very exhaustive study. Possibly we have more data now, somebody can collect it. But these studies, two studies, gave totally opposing views. One said that, well, it works. One said that it doesn't work. But clinically, we have seen that it works in patients, selected subgroup of patients where everything else has failed. This is a patient where everything else has failed. Would she even benefit by orbital decompression? A woody orbit? She cannot move her eye at all. What would you decompress? You can only decompress bone. You cannot remove much fat here because fat is all absolutely fibrous. Even these such patients can have partial relief. I started even moving at least. You can see that I, I, I was absolutely not moving up. Started moving at least slightly and she was she got a little bit of binocular field of fixation by using rituximab. This one more patient who had fixed isotropia where squint surgery is simply not possible. In fact, squint surgeon denied, you know, he refused to perform squint surgery at this point in time. She had had prior orbital decompression. She has failed everything. And here again, rituximab is something that gave her partial relief. This was one more patient where you can see reasonable amount of relief. This patient again had hypertropia. It's normalized and she has relief after rituximab. Teplutumumab is the recent drug. As I said, it's FDA approved. The beauty of teplutumab is that it has the most pronounced activity on exophthalmus so far. Of all the known drugs that are used for medical management, teplutumumab is the most effective in terms of reduction in proptosis. So with teplutumumab in place, if at all you have to do decompression for exophthalmus, the chance of or the need for you to do that would reduce much because it is most efficacious against exophthalmus of all medications. So your need for surgery will reduce further if you have teprotomumab in your armamentarium. Well, it also reduces clinical activity score for which it is, it is used. So all the studies are pointing to the fact that teprotomumab is useful. Something that is new is bortezomib, which is actually a drug that is reserved for IgG4 disease, IgG4 related disease. This patient, young patient, some point in time, he recurred very severely. He was under emission and he was found to have very high or elevated IgG4 levels where adding bortezomib actually helped him settle down. So there are some patients which are discovering currently that some of these patients who are young and who rebound have high IgG, serum IgG4 levels. Of course, you don't do biopsy in them. If the extraocular muscle is affected, there's no point doing biopsy and condemning them to diplopia because you are tectonically making the muscle uh, deficient. So in such patients, if the patient has a higher IgG4 level, based just on serum IgG4 level, you don't have to have the complete criteria for IgG4-related disease met. You can still start these patients on anti-IgG4 therapy and bortezomib is something that has helped. About eyelid retraction, as we already uh, discussed, some of these patients just the medical management alone, the drugs, intravenous methylprednisolone, immunomodulation, biologicals, bring down the late retraction in two ways. One is that late retraction itself comes down. The second is that because of reduction in exophthalmus, late retraction also comes down. You know that, right? So reduction in exophthalmus itself can bring down the late retraction. For every two millimeter reduction in exophthalmus lid retraction reduces by a millimeter. Gross rule of thumb. You know, all patients don't behave similarly, but that's a gross rule of thumb. In such patients, we would do levator recession in the cold phase of the disease. Lid last, of course. If you have to do decompression, you do the first, then the extraocular muscle surgery is second, and lids are always the last. We would do levator recession. But if a patient did not need orbital decompression or did not need squint surgery, you can do primary lid levator recession as well. But when you just do a PubMed search and take out all the literature that talk about surgical correction of lit retraction, you will find a number of studies mind-boggling. Not even more common diseases will have so many published studies. This is not one page. This is, you can see, 
the next page also has this is one page this is a second page and that is not the end this is data only till 2010 there are more studies there are many more studies this table doesn't summarize all the studies that are there for later recession so why so many studies have been done for a simple procedure if it were to be effective with maybe one or two studies people would have thought okay it is effective why do we do how to do more studies it's an established thing why people don't do studies on jones procedure for lower lid entropy on anymore isn't it because it's an established procedure when something is not established when you're getting variable results we will try to modify the surgical technique and publish their own surgical technique hoping that it will be better than what the other person published but people will not get satisfied because it's not giving results in their own hands they do a little more modification and then keep publishing that adds up to the literature, but really doesn't add up to the benefits of the surgery. Well, I, I am uh, comfortable doing levator recession, but some of these patients complain a lot. Their major complaint is that they have a high lid crease and a flat lid contour. High lid crease is something that is unavoidable, right? And titration is sometimes difficult. You seem to have corrected nicely on the table, but some of these patients tend to have lateral flare for which you have to cut the lateral horn and once you cut the lateral horn it becomes very unpredictable patients can have a temporal droop as well which is very difficult to fix so you are conservative during surgery because you don't want to give them ptosis or temporal droop but patients are not really happy because you don't have titratable results so that is the re reason why at least primarily before we declare the patient non-responsive to medical therapy. That's why we want to do surgery, fine. Otherwise, we would want to try medical management. There are patients, short, short series, where subconjunctival transloan has been used. We use a little deeper subconjunctival transloan beyond the conjunctiva, going into the levator, right? transconjunctival. So transconjunctival, intra-LPS, transloan, you can use dose from anywhere between 10 to 20 or even 30 milligram injected in the center of the lid for sure. And if a patient has a temporal flare, you inject a little bit more on the temporal side as well. Okay? So you uh, place the drug where it is required, not much on the medial side. And we give a treatment-free gap of about six to eight weeks, reasses the patient. And if the drug is gone, it's a deposteroid. Then you inject it again and again. So generally three injections. And at the end of three injections, I would say at least half the patients, maybe about 60 to 70% of patients definitely benefit. They don't need surgery. They're happy with the appearance and their lead crease doesn't really go high with steroids. And we haven't come across patients who have a spike of IOP with steroids at least in our states. Now, alternatives to steroids would be injection of 5-fluorouracil, which is currently being contemplated. There are other drugs that also can be used, but transalone and 5-fluorouracil possibly will have effect. Transalone is anti-inflammatory and also it can induce fat deposition in the levator palpebra superioris. There is a one single case that, that has shown where following transloan injection, when they had to do levator surgery in that patient because the patient had ptosis, they found that the levator was totally fat infiltrated. But we don't know whether fat infiltration was already there before transloan was injected or not. So it's just could be anecdotal. This is one patient who has benefited from transloan. So intra levator or subconjunctival transloan definitely helps these patients. It may not put the lid back to where it was earlier, but patients are happy enough not to ask for further surgical intervention. 5-fluorouracil, actually because of its property for scar modulation, may work on a tight levator and that may help these patients. So we don't have much personal experience with that, but transloan is something that has helped these patients. This is one more example of a patient who has benefited with Chancellor. So if you want me to show a flow chart, that would be this flow chart or kind of the sequence of events 
that happens if a patient has mild disease control thyroid status use selenium selenium is not used only in patients where uh, who are from selenium deficient geographic locations it can be used in anybody for about 6 months lubricants non steroid and anti inflammatory drugs have limited role but oral steroids short course of oral steroids quit smoking not even passive smoking intra lps steroids for eyelid retraction and observe if it is moderate to severe severity with active disease then low dose intravenous methylprednisolone pulse therapy good response observe suboptimal response then you can go to intra orbital steroids low dose radiation which i don't personally advocate maintenance systemic immunosuppressants or immunobiological and then finally sequential surgery severe side threatening high dose intravenous methylprednisolone pulse therapy if there is good response you continue medical management if there is suboptimal response or worsening then you go for an early trans uh, nasal endoscopic deep medial wall orbital decompression now after all this finally you may ask why don't we do surgery you know you heard of nearly one hour long lecture but still you may have some doubt in your mind as to well if a patient has apparent inactive disease he has come to the clinic today i haven't seen the patient earlier i don't know what is the status of the patient i haven't plotted the clinical course of the disease but i see the patient today patient has inactive disease has exophthalmos do i do surgery that is a big no unless you have observed the patient yourself that the patient is free of activity for at least 3 months ideally 6 months you should not do surgery what if a patient has active disease but if i still do surgery this is a summation of all the data that is published in the literature larger series that i could come across this was put together several years ago the i don't think there is much new addition these percentages will not change much now if a patient had active disease at surgery and you have pr done primary surgery then the chance of rebound or recurrence of activity is 24 to 40% which will have a direct impact on the durability of your surgery so about 40% of patients will have no use for the surgery that you have performed on them and in fact will have active disease again as opposed to it if a patient has inactive disease at surgery and you have done primary surgery then it is 4 to 22% if a patient has primary medical treatment and has inactive disease when you do surgery so patient had active disease you did primary medical treatment and is in active at surgery that is the least chance of recurrence of activity 2 to 15% so this is obviously you know collection of all the data it's not a meta analysis or something just for you to eyeball data but it is evident that control of activity or remission from activity at the time of surgery with prior medical management gives you the best results in terms of effect of surgery and also the rate of recurrence of disease activity so possibly this is one of the strongest reasons why we should perform medical management in a any patient where it is indicated before you jump on to do surgery so in conclusion i would say that medical management is indicated as primary management in moderate to severe active active thyroid disease and in active tdd with threat to vision severe active tdd with threat to vision intravenous methylprednisolone oral immunomodulation rituximab and currently deputumumab are escalating in terms of you know how you use them start with ivmp then add oral immunomodulation mycophenolate mofetil or azathioprine or cyclosporine then if they don't respond or if they reactivate then you have a scope to add rituximab or deputumumab they have reasonable success in terms of reduction in exophthalmos and diplopia in functional positions of gaze but they have impress impressive response in terms of remission from activity and of course biologicals are knocking on the door so before you reconstruct the house you should douse the fire and 
the medical management is aimed to do exactly that. You douse the fire, wait, and then rebuild a home or rebuild the orbit by whatever surgery that you plan to perform. Thank you so much. Any questions? Uh, thank you so much, sir, for such a beautiful lecture. Uh, we have a few questions, sir. Uh, when do we consider intravenous methylprednisolone in a case of an inactive TED? In a patient with inactive TED, I showed certain examples, right? If a patient has diplopia in primary position of gaze or in functional positions of gaze with grossly thickened extraocular muscles, where you cannot do extraocular muscle surgery because the muscle is thick, and you know that if you perform extraocular muscle surgery in an inflamed muscle, it's not going to work or the durability of the surgery is going to be low. Right? How else can you control this? Patient does not deserve orbital decompression because he has no indication for decompression. He has, doesn't have much of exophthalmus, but his muscles are thicker. So muscle you know, selectively affected and swollen such patients are selected for intravenous methylprednisolone. Sir, and in such cases, like what should be the ideal gap between IVMP and intraorbital steroids? So when you start withdrawing intravenous methylprednisolone, that is the time when you should consider intraorbital, maybe with the last pulse of IVMP or six weeks thereafter. Right? So if you are already choosing to treat the patient with immunomodulation, following intravenous methylprednisolone, then I would reserve intraorbital steroids towards the end. Sir, is there a preferred approach in choosing azathioprine versus mycophenolate morphetal in oral immunomodulation? Mycophenolate morphetal is preferred, but cost is a definitely a barrier. Mycophenolate morphetal is more expensive, azathioprine is less expensive. Both have almost comparable safety profile. So, given a choice, I would prefer mycophenolate. Um, and, and sir, in cases of uh, like whenever we prescribe mycophenolate morphetal, we usually give it in terms of say or azathioprine over a period of six months. When do we begin to taper uh, azathioprine or mycophenolate morphetal from a BD dosing to yeah. one Yeah, so you don't prematurely reduce or stop these medications unless the patient has side effects. If a patient has side effect, there's a scope to halve the dose. You know, if you're giving 500 milligram twice a day, you can make it 500 milligram once a day and see if the patient settles down. Or if the patient doesn't settle down or the side effects are severe enough, then you can stop it and choose other medications. Or at the end of six months, you stop these medications. Yes. Uh, so in a case of uh, inactive TED, who has like previously received uh, pulsed uh, steroid therapy, uh, is there a role for only immunomodulation if we see um, uh, increased extraocular muscle thickness on a CT orbit scan? On follow-up visit, if you find, suppose you've already done IV MP and then the patient comes back for follow-up after a year, year and a half, and you have fresh signs of activity or a new onset diplopia, you find that the extraocular muscle is thickened, then you can start immunomodulation for sure, there's no doubt. But you also start a short course of oral steroids. If it is severe enough, then you can start intravenous methylprednisolone all over again. Second challenge. But if it is not severe enough, you start oral steroids, which will take care of the immediate need of the patient. And by the time your course of oral steroids, which is given for about four to six weeks, is ending, your immunomodulation would have kicked off. So that's how it is. So in a case of... Uh... Active TED, which has been treated on lines of Yugova initially for the first six uh, IVMP uh, cycles and uh, has had a rebound. So, do we again, whenever we reinitiate IVMP, do we go by Yugova guidelines or do we go with this? Uh... Totally up to the clinician. Yugova guidelines are absolutely great. In fact, most of the world uses it. But if you have a different experience with a more lazy, low dose protocol then that is fine so you if you have used either of that for a given patient there is no reason why you should stick to the same depending on what experience you have with what form of delivery of these drugs finally the dose is nearly the same it's the frequency that is different and i feel that three weekly is better only because 
of the effect of intravenous methylprednisolone on abnormal circulating activated T lymphocytes. Right? It induces their apoptosis and with every pulse of intravenous methylprednisolone, about two-thirds of the activated T lymphocytes, circulating activated T lymphocytes are knocked out of the system. And if by giving six weekly, you reach a level which is not critical at the end of six pulses. Right. So that is the reason why it appears sounds more scientific. And also the logistics of giving and evaluation of the patient is also a consideration. Every week, you know, it obviously involves a day of treatment in the sense that the patient goes to the hospital, he has to be evaluated, and then this IV methylprednisolone has to be given slowly over one to two hours, and the patient has to be observed, right? So the intensiveness of the treatment versus the benefit that the patient derives out of it versus a three-weekly protocol, which can be sustained for more than four and a half months. And while the patient is on any of this, there is hardly ever any chance of rebound, correct? Whereas if you have completed your treatment within a matter of six weeks, the patient may still rebound because you have accelerated everything, used up the dose already, like four and a half grams, you're already used up patient is still rebound. But here you're giving it for four and a half months. You're actually prolonging the comfort of the patient for four and a half months within which the patient has very low chance of rebounding. Now we have a huge series. I think you have stopped analyzing the data. We have all, we have hundreds of patients which you can easily analyze and compare, use the same parameters as you go go study and then compare with the published results. You know, you take two millimeter reduction in exophthalmos, two millimeter reduction in lit retraction, clinical activity score, whatever that has been studied as parameters or uh, outcome measures earlier. If you compare, you'll know yourself whether it is comparable, inferior, or superior. So, when we uh, talk about accumulative dosing and we still talk about uh, the half life or the effect of the drug lasting for say three weeks say 28 days uh, on the activated t lymphocytes uh, like can you explain what is this cumulative dosing because the drug cumulative is getting... doses no cumulative dose is nothing to do with uh, uh, you know activity or any of that sort you know that intravenous methylprednisolo can cause osteopenia osteoporosis can induce premature osteoporosis can have aseptic necrosis of the uh, head of femur right so those are microvascular complications, those and also cardiological side effects, induction of diabetes mellitus, all this is higher once you cross the toxicity of intravenous methyl, hepatotoxicity for that matter. All this is higher once you cross the threshold of 4 grams. It's not that you should not go higher than 4 grams, it is just that you should be aware that the patient has a higher risk if you go higher than 4 grams. And you can go higher if the benefit that the patient is going to derive is more. Like if a patient is losing vision, then with due precautions, you can go up to 8 grams, 12 grams, whatever that the patient needs. Or if you have an alternative method of treatment, you can do that. But if a patient does not need more than 4 grams, why give more? Yeah. Um, that is all we have from the questions end for tonight, sir. Before we conclude, I have a small announcement to make. Uh, we meet next on the 22nd of December. There is an international masterclass on thyroid eye disease, the approach to surgery by none other than Dr. Robert Goldberg and Dr. Daniel Rootman. Please join in on 22nd December. Hope to see you all. There. Send them the link today, sir. Yes, sir. Thank you. Good night. Good night, sir.